Hello, and welcome to the lecture on conduction, convection, and radiation, collectively known as heat flow. All right, because what this section is all about, the end of chapter 11, is how heat, represented by the letter Q, how it gets from point A to point B. Okay, so it is heat flowing from one point to another, and specifically the rate at which the heat flows, the Q per time. Okay. And it turns out that there are three mechanisms by which heat can move from point A to point B. And those are conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay, so conduction is heat flow through direct contact. This is heat flow when two substances touch each other. This, was in, this would include touching air, so you can have conduction into the air from a material. However, air has a very low thermal conductivity, okay? So that means that things don't flow through the air very, very easily at all because of that low thermal conductivity. So although it's possible that that's not going to be the primary means that heat leaves from a solid into the air. But where conduct conduction is really important is going to be through a solid. So you have two you know, bodies of air that are separated by a solid like a wall that you have conduction through the wall. Okay, so let's get to the examples. So it's driven by conservation of momentum and energy between collisions of particles or vibrations of those particles. I just wrote vibrations for, for short. So vibrations would be the primary mechanism of a solid. You know, so you basically all those, all the, the nuclei are attached to each other, they start to wiggle. There's basically a wave of that energy that then would pass through that lattice of the solid, all the, all the atoms connected. Um, and obviously in a, in a liquid or a gas, and it would be through collisions, and the collisions would propagate through, okay, because it requires that, that, that direct um, contact. And I say um, conservation of momentum and energy. I mean, obviously, that, that's assuming that the particles are operating in a completely elastic way. I mean, that is one way to model particles. We've seen that sort of idea when we looked at the internal energy of an ideal gas, and it was three halves nRT. That was that, was that type of model, thinking about the atoms as, as colliding with each other in a perfectly elastic way. But that's not necessarily the case. We hinted at the idea that non-ideal gases have other ways of um, storing energy, like vibrational energy of the, um, the atoms themselves or even the molecules more likely the molecules. So, but importantly, you know, it's that it's not always conservation of energy, but it's always conservation, conservation of momentum. Okay. And lastly, a couple more examples. So heat flowing through the pane of glass are insulation, insulation walls. Okay. That's maybe the most common examples of conduction. So the other way that heat can flow from one point to another is convection. Okay, that's heat flow through the bulk movement of fluids. You always see it described this way, the bulk movement of fluids. That's a technical talk for the fact that it's, that it's packets of the fluid. The fluid doesn't, don't move as individual particles. Um, I guess that's really what separate, se separates it from conduction through the air. Because although the air is not particularly good at conducting energy, you can have a bunch of warm air molecules that are together and rise kind of collectively. All right, that's that idea of bulk movement. So convection is always in pockets of molecules, not individual molecules. And if we think about it, um, what it's driven by is the idea of hot, low-density fluid rising with a buoyant force, almost acting like a balloon, but without the actual membrane to hold the balloon in. Instead, it's just a pocket that's held together due to the, the kind of the lack of mixing that's occurring at the surface for whatever reasons. Okay? And then obviously cool, dense pockets of fluid would sink, well, you know, um, in that case because the buoyant force would be less than the gravitational force. And, okay, this forms convection cells. So what happens is you have pockets of warm air and cool air rising, but those pockets themselves form a larger circular structure that we call the cell. So a convection cell could, you know, look something like this, right? It's this large, large cell, like, you know, amount of fluid on a big scale. I mean, you know, maybe if it's air, you know, on the scale of like, you know, much larger than, you know, I'd say cities or something, okay? And... This includes updrafts in the atmosphere and downdrafts, maybe updrafts of what we notice, and then, you know, they, maybe the air is kind of being pushed back down over a wide region, but a very tight, um, you know, like focused updraft. Um, molten rock, um, so convection is very important in Earth's mantle. Um, lava lamps are a good example, because you can really see the pockets in that case. Let's do the two fluids that don't uh, mix in the lava lamp, but it, you know, it's kind of this dramatic, dramaticized version of convection, but it's, it's quite visible and memorable, and you really kind of see the, the hot pockets rising and they eventually reach the top, they're allowed to cool and then they'll sink back down once they've cooled. 
That's convection for you, the bulk movement of fluids. All right, so and flu again, fluids, including you know, gases and liquids, are going to transmit energy more readily through convection than conduction. Okay? Um, and then we have the idea of radiation. What is that? Well, that's heat flowing through electromagnetic radiation, light. So that's heat. Heat, after all, is energy, right? It's, it's, it's in joules. And since it is energy, and, and heat is just the idea that you can have a, a temperature transfer, right? Because it, or we, you know, have temperature between two substances reach thermal equilibrium. That's, that's when heat flows, after all. And since we are just talking about temperature, that means that you know, obviously light can warm things up, so light has to be a means of heat flow. Now, it's kind of strange to refer to light itself, you know, here, you know, known as the idea of radiation, because light is radiation, that it's more fundamental than the other two means of heat flow, that those being, of course, conduction and convection. It, I mean, because light is a much bigger topic. And, and so, but again, it is getting heat energy from one point to another. So it does count as a means of heat flow, heat flow, okay? And where does it come from, right? Because I kind of talked about the mechanisms of convection and conduction, but I guess it's important to then to ask maybe a, a different question about radiation well, okay, so, you know, these are ultimately, you know, driven by mechanical processes. These are, you know, molecules either, you know, individually bumping into each other or moving in a big bulk bubble, right? Well, in either case, again, it's, it's really a mechanical process primarily. Um, you know, there are electromagnetic forces that maybe hold things together at the molecular scale, but the, the movement is mechanical. Well, radiation isn't. The movement itself is electromagnetic. And so essentially it's, it's motion turning into another form of energy, turning into light. And the way that happens, there's one mechanism alone in all of physics that creates light, and that is the acceleration of charged particles, all right? That's, that is what is creating the light. And the, the, the detailed explanation, the beautiful explanation of how that works step by step is a big part of, of the next semester of physics, physics 36, all right? So that's radiation, heat as heat flow, right? Looking at it as heat flow. Um, the, it is the only form of heat flow that can travel in a vacuum. Right? So big, big difference. Again, these ones require, well, matter. Okay? Radiation doesn't. Okay? Um, so heat from the sun reaching the earth absolutely is, is traveling through radiation. How else could it travel through, through space? Uh, heat, uh, heat lamps, right? They put off, you, know, they, you see them glowing hot, then that, that heat they're producing. Is, it's, it's not reaching you via conduction or convection. I mean, you know, there is some movement of air, right? You can see the ripples of air, right? But that's not the primary means. You're feeling the heat directly from the light. Right? That's why they can sunburn you, for example, because they're not just creating visible light, they're also creating ultraviolet light. Uh, hair dryers, um, thermal imaging cameras, they work because they can, um, they can look at the, the spectrum of the light that comes off of objects that are cooler than the thermal radiation that our eyes have evolved to see. Because we have a certain mo minimum wavelength that we can see, which is about 500 nanometers, but we ourselves glow with light that is longer than that, well, maximum wavelength, minimum frequency. And we can't see our own color that we emit, but we are constantly emitting low energy light, thus long wavelength light. And that's the idea of a thermal imaging camera is looking at that heat that's coming off of, say, a person or an object, you know, room temperature ob um, objects. Okay. All right. So those are the, the three mechanisms of heat flow. Okay. And there are two equations. Okay. Because this is not an equation, it's just constant. So that means that one of the two mechanisms doesn't have an associated equation with it. And indeed, it is convection. We have no way of quantifying convection in this class. The, the discussion of quantifying convection is too complicated. It doesn't have one simple, simple formula to describe it, all right? But we do have our two here, this one being for conduction, zoom in a bit. So this formula applying to conduction, and then the second formula applying to radiation, okay? All right, so let's look at them. Zoom in, there we have conductive power, okay? So power is heat per time, measured in watts, but this is power, the wattage of something that's conducting heat, okay? So Q over T is power because that's joules per second, okay? That's a watt. So Q over T is a form of power. We're not represented as P, well, just to call special attention to the fact that it's heat, okay? So heat per time. And then we got some constants and some temperature terms, so what's going on here, okay? So this first one, K, is the coefficient of thermal conductivity. So it is the material specific constant that tells you how easily energy flows through something via conduction. Okay, so 
We'll talk kind of about a big implication of that in a concept question, but it's just, it's the rate at which energy, well, it's the constant that sets the rate at which energy flows through something, okay? Via conduction. Anyway, so then we've got the cross-sectional area, all right? So this is how much area is in contact with the heat and thus facilitating the conduction, okay? So bigger surfaces conduct more energy per time. Of course they do because there's, there's more, there's just more surfaces, there's more molecules that are able to transmit that energy, okay? Then we've got length, which is the thickness. Notice that here, you know, our power of conduction was proportional to the constant n to a, so the, big, the bigger the constant and the bigger the cross-sectional area, the, the greater the rate of heat flow. But we have an inverse proportionality to the, to the thickness, which makes sense because thicker walls, thicker materials through which heat is passing via conduction, well, that means slower rate because it takes longer for the molecules to pass on that energy. All right, and then we've got the temperature difference because if two substances, maybe on either side of a wall, are a greater temperature difference from each other, then the heat will flow faster and then will gradually slow down as their temperatures approach thermal equilibrium. But when they're most unequal, means the fastest rate of heat flow, the fastest Q over T, okay, the power of conduction. And so then the, this is the temperature on either side of the material measured in Kelvin. Okay, here it doesn't matter if it's Celsius because it is just the difference between the temperatures, but you can use Kelvin, all right? Next one, radiative power, okay? so. This is just like conductive power, but it is power, heat per time, that is being transmitted via, via radi radiation. And that means different constants, different considerations, okay? And we're not giving the derivation for either of these. These are just being given to you as pre-made formulas. All right, so if you look at the constants, maybe the first one that jumps out is this letter here, which is epsilon, okay? Greek letter, one that we haven't seen before, okay? Um, and, well, first term I'm gonna talk about is the surface area. Okay, this is different than the cross-sectional area because when things radiate, think the sun, you need the surface area of a sphere to consider. Whereas here, the cross-sectional area would just be the, the wall surface, okay? But like, not like a cross-section rather than, you know, trying to find like, you know, treat the, the wall like a rectangle because you don't care about the, the, the top or the bottom. You only care about that one exposed side. But this has to be more of a 3D consideration. So for a sphere, for example, it would be 4 pi r squared, the, surf the formula for the surface area of a sphere, all right? And then we have the surface temperature of the object that's radiating, en radiating an energy. In the case of the sun, 5,600 Kelvin. Okay. In the case of a person, right, about 270 Kelvin. Okay. Produce very different types of light, but they both create light. All right. And also, you can see which one will create more energy per time. Because look at this. The temperature is raised to the fourth power. Wow. That is a really high power for an equation, right? Right? Again, you might wonder where this comes from, but we won't show the derivation because you don't see things raised to the fourth power every day, right? And we haven't in any equation that we have seen derived in this class so far, okay? And then what do you, what's T2? It's the surrounding temperature, okay? Also measured in Kelvin. And here, it matters. If you use Celsius for this, this formula, you will get the wrong answer. Don't do it because only Kelvin will get you the correct answer because raising something to any power, especially the fourth power, well, then the number actually matters, okay? All right? And that will note that that surrounding temperature is defined as zero if it's a vacuum, okay? If the surrounding environment is a vacuum, okay? And finally, on to the last thing, emissivity, that, that Greek letter epsilon. What is it, okay? Well, it is a measure of how shiny or dull a material is, okay? And you can read shiny as reflective, okay? And dull is, well, non-reflective. All right, and the, the, the upper and lower limit that you need to consider to make sense of the number, and you'll basically be given it, but just you know, to, be, to not have it just be a strange number, because it's a simple concept, at least at this level, is that if epsilon equals one, okay, this should be an epsilon, I don't know why I wrote it as an E, just a typo. So if epsilon equals one, that means perfectly shiny, perfectly reflective, okay? If epsilon equals zero, that means perfectly dull, all right? So if you look at... The idea here, what happens if, if epsilon is zero? There's no heat flow at all. There's no Q over T because multi you'd multiply everything by zero, okay? So that would completely stop the flow of heat. So something that is, you know, is going to be entirely, you know, entirely, um, oh, I think I have these backwards because, of course, something that is black is going to, is going to radiate energy better. Yeah, I have these switched, okay? Um, so here's the idea. 
It's zero here and a one here. Let me, and let me quickly explain why, and I'll, I'll correct this in the notes to get uploaded, is that zero, when it's perfectly shiny, okay, that is a substance that can't absorb any radiate, radiate energy, energy nor emit it because it's perfectly reflective which means all the radiant energy that's coming to is bouncing off. That doesn't mean that, that also means it can't actually get any, any energy away from it, right? It is, the, it is no way for it to radiate energy if it is perfectly shiny, okay? That is, again, an emissivity of zero. On the other hand, something that is completely like a black body, as, as it's called, so completely dull, well, it will radiate energy at the maximum rate, so basically, because what we're seeing, when we see something that is, that is, that is a black body, that means that it is, it is able to both absorb all energies and emit all energies. And in fact, that's the easiest way to remember it because you can think, okay, well, additive colors, blue, green, and red, they're giving you this, you know, this, this combination of, of white light, okay? So then an object that is black is then, you know, is, is an absorber of all forms of light because nothing is being rejected. So you're not, since it's absorbing all wavelengths, it appears black, the opposite of white, okay? So again, the corrected version should be that zero is perfectly shiny, no ability to emit heat, okay, through, uh, through radiation. And black is perfectly dull, is a value, an emissivity of one, the, the best radiator of heat energy, okay? And the last value here gets its own line and that's sigma, all right? Um, or it, yeah, the sigma, this one that we had epsilon before, all right, that's the one that looks like an E. And then this one here is sigma, the Greek letter, lowercase. And sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And it is a constant that's only used for this formula, the formula for the radiative power, okay, the heat per time for radiation. All right, and it's 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight, so small value, and then it's power per area per temperature to the fourth, okay? All right, so let's do a couple of quick examples. All right, so two types, really short explanation here. Those involve conduction and radiation, right? I just decided to split them up that way. So example one, find the energy transferred in one hour by conduction through a concrete wall that is two meters high, 3.65 meters long, and 0.2 meters thick, okay? And if one side of the wall is held at 20 degrees and the other side is held at negative 20 degrees, okay? And the thermal conductivity of concrete, K, the constant, material specific constant, is 0.84 joules per meter per second per Kelvin, right? Because it's watts per time per temperature, which is the same as this, okay? Just expressing watts as joules per meter. All right, so Set up our formula, our formula, for, our formula for conductive heat flow, okay? And then note that the area is just going to be 2 times 3.65, which is 7.3 square meters, because they're both given meters. All right, and then consider the constant, just to collect our values. Then we'll plug everything in. Notice all, the only difference here is I multiply both sides by T, picked it up there. So we just isolated the Q, all right? Because then I can then um, find the total heat flow, all right, in, in that amount of time. And the time was given as an hour, which is... Uh, 3,600 seconds, 60 times 60. Plug in all the values, okay? Again, you know, because it's negative 20 outside and it's 20 inside, essentially. And we get that much energy would flow in an hour, okay? Which means if you want to maintain the greater temperature inside, that's, what, how, that's how much energy it would take, say, to run a heater to maintain the temperature of 20 inside when the temperature remains negative 20 outside, okay? So a lot of energy, right? Okay, so that's conduction, conduction through, through a surface. And that's the, that's the way you really see any uh, quantitative problem on this topic. Now, the other, the other thing to consider is the concept of it, because there's actually a neat, neat way to think about conduction. And question, question here, why does a, concept question, why does a wool sweater feel warmer than a shirt of steel chain mail? And the idea here is, you know, like, not that you, you know, necessarily have worn both a wool sweater and chain mail, but that obviously when you touch metal, it's cool to the touch, and when you touch wool, you put wool on, like a wool sweater, it's warm to the touch. Why is that? Okay. Well, the small value of thermal conductivity for wool determines the fact that it feels warm. Okay. It has a thermal, thermal conductivity of 0 0.029 watts per meter Kelvin, all right, which is very different than the concrete, right? Quite a bit smaller, right? Over 10 times smaller. But 
can, now it's considered steel. Now steel is a metal, okay? There are actually other metals that have much higher rates. So I guess they would feel even cooler to the touch up to a, up to a limit of how our cells operate. But there's a much value, bigger value, about 50 watts per meter per Kelvin, all right? And I mean, so yeah, now we're really seeing, you know, like really three orders of magnitude difference between the two, right? Dramatic difference, okay? And that manifests itself in things feeling cool or warm to the touch. It is thermal conductivity that makes objects feel warm or cool. End of story. It's not the specific heat of them. It's not, you know, it's not some other property. It, it is the thermal conductivity because things that feel cool, they quickly allow heat to start flowing from you to them. That triggers a sensation of cool in the, in the nerve cells on your skin. On the other hand, when you touch something and it doesn't very quickly draw away the heat from your hand, right? Or it's already at thermal equilibrium because it can, it can maintain that equilibrium easier because then the energy will flow out of it very slowly. Well, then it feels warm to the touch. Another kind of a concept question, open-ended one. Stainless steel has a specific heat of 400, or, yeah, 490 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Okay? Now, that was, this is specific heat. Okay? This is a concept from the, la, the um, previous lectures. A thermal conductivity of 16 watts per meter degree Celsius, an emissivity of 0 0.07. Okay? So this, this emissivity here, you can see, is, is not particularly high. All right? So it's actually a fairly, fairly small value. All right? The stainless steel, because it is quite reflective. Okay? And a density given here. All right. Cast iron, on the other hand, has a specific heat that is um, basically um, basically the same, right? Very, very similar. 490 versus 460. So really, really, very little difference. So it's about the same amount of energy per mass, you know, per per degree. Thermal, thermal conductivity that is noted notably higher, okay? And an emissivity that is really high because it's nearly black, okay? Which is best for heat flow, okay? So it's actually, it's able to radiate energy quite well, right? If that's its primary means of, you know, of, so that is, that is notably different, right? This one was not going to be emitting much light, the stainless steel, but the, um, you know, the cast iron will, okay? It's got a density that is a little bit less than the density of steel, right? Not dramatically so, but significantly less. So based on this, inf in, on this information, what could you say about the relative cooking performance? What information would help us answer this question, okay? So think about this. The thickness is not comparable between the two. Okay, so cast iron is made much thicker, really, you know, probably 20 times thicker. The roughness on the surfaces could change the surface area. So the, the rough cast iron, having a, a rough surface means that it actually has a much, much greater A. That, and then also considering that with its, its higher ability to radiate energy, right, rather, rather than maybe just, you know, like just transmit energy through conduction, you got to wonder, you know, how, how important is the radiated heat flow alpha cast iron, right? Because it could be quite important. Based on the thermal conductivity and emissivity, cast iron should cook faster. So it should be able to deliver a greater amount of heat. Because although the, 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 um, the thermal conductivity, actually, yeah, the thermal conductivity is higher and its ability to radiate is higher. So it just should cook things faster. Just, just definitely more heat per time coming from the cast iron. All right? But the much larger mass means it would take longer to reach thermal equilibrium. So that, that's an interesting, so there's, there's kind of this, this interesting idea that it also means that it would maintain it longer. It would, it would be able, it holds in more heat and that, that heat then just simply takes more time for that energy to dissipate, even, even at the greater rate. And the reason I say even at the greater rate is the fact that, you know, the densities are kind of are comparable and everything. So it's not like cast iron is, is just denser, you know, it's just that it's made so much thicker and that thickness would really dramatically change its volume. So all interesting things to consider and a real kind of real life consideration of heat flow. All right, now back on to the, the problems that involve numbers. All right, so example two, a cylindrical filament uh, is in an evacuated light bulb. It's got a certain diameter. So this is actual like the filament, right? Thinking of it as a cylinder. So it's got a diameter D, all right? Uh, emissivity of 0.95. So it's able to glow really well, all right? Because um, the idea here is that a filament would, you know, when it's not on, would not appear shiny, okay? It's, or in order to really glow hot like that, it would have a, a, you know, kind of a dark, a dark color to it, all right? Uh, it, is, it maintains a temperature of 4,800 degrees Celsius. And what should the length of the filament be in order for 120 watts of power to be emitted, okay? And I, I talk about what we're considering here. Since we don't care about the ends of the filament, we're only interested in the surface area of it, okay? Which is going to be 2 pi RL. 
Okay, that is going to be the, the, the A that we that we need to consider, the cross-section area. All right, all at once, here's the, here's all, all the, the numbers, everything, right? So this is the formula we're using, the one for um, radiative heat flow. Notice there's no T2. That's because it's a vacuum. So T2 equals zero, okay? Um, and then we'll just plug in our values here, okay? And then we just solve for the length, right? 1.4 centimeters, right? And you can see that basically just plugged in the emissivity where it goes, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, um, you know, the, the, the given surface area, um, the temperature, right, converted to Kelvin, which is very important because the 4,800 and, you know, 5,000 might not seem that far apart, but when you're raising the fourth power, you're going to get very different numbers. Okay. All right. Let's do a last one here. Okay. So this one's also going to involve radiative heat flow, but also it's involve a little bit of, uh, of actually changing the temperature of, of something interior. So a person stands naked in the snow on a brisk day in Siberia, where uh, the temperature outside is 0.5 degrees Celsius. If we take their body surface temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, all right, their emissivity is 0.9, okay, so they're a black body, they're able to both absorb and radiate energy pretty easily, okay, and uh, they have a, a total surface area of 1.65 square meters, they got a mass of 7.5 kilograms, and a, and a specific heat, which is the same as of water, 4,186 joules per kilogram Kelvin, okay. Uh, if their internal body, body temperature starts at 37, how long will it take them to become hypothermic? Which, by the way, um, starts at 32 degrees Celsius. I don't remember what that is in Fahrenheit, <laughs> but there it is in Celsius. All right. So the idea is that they're maintaining a surface temperature, so you know, they're, which is not entirely accurate, but it would be at some point. You know, they, I guess the body does try to cool down at surface temperature because it will help keep the internal temperature from not falling too rapidly. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, can definitely be a kind of a, a natural biological response. But at the same time, um, that it, it wouldn't, um, you know, there, there's, your body would also still be pumping, you know, blood through your skin. So it would, it wouldn't fall off too, too steep. So the idea here is that we're just assuming it maintains at 25. All right. So we're going to use radiative heat flow. There's going to be our temperature, our, our formula. We're going to have both a T1 and a T2, right? Because we were given three temperatures after all. Okay. And so we'll use um, the surrounding air temperature as T2, and T1 is the skin temperature, all right? Um, so surface temp is, uh, is T1, there it is in Kelvin, okay? Um, and then Q um, from the relation to specific heat and mass, so I'm actually gonna solve for Q. So what I'm gonna do is I know that I have the, you know, the person's total mass, I've, I'm treating their specific heat as the same as water, and, the, and I want their temperature to change five Kelvin, okay? Or five degrees Celsius, because they're going from 37 to 32. Okay, there's because they're, they're imagining this kind of a, a, a hunk of water and we're cooling that hunk of water. It's a, simp, it's a simplified model of the person, right? And this is how much energy it would take to do that. So what we're going to do then is just plug that in and solve for T. All right, so then time is going to be that amount of energy, okay? And then divided by everything that was on the right-hand side of the equation as, as you know, expressed in the key equations, okay? And then just plug in everything because we know everything. We know the emissivity. We know Stefan Boltzmann. We know the surface area we're given it. And we're given the two temperatures once we identified what's what. So we plug it all in, okay, the Q that we found from M times specific heat times change temperature, and what do we get? 8,100 seconds or 2.6 hours, okay, for them to be, become hypothermic. And again, I, I guess this is a, this is a underestimate of how long someone could remain non-hypothermic because, as I mentioned, this is kind of a worst case scenario. For some reason, your body is keeping your surface temperature, your skin temperature really quite warm, which is not helping. Okay? It'd be better for this to be lower because that's going to slow down the heat flow because this being a bigger difference means dividing, you know, basically dividing by a, um, well, it's, you know, dividing by a bigger number, okay? And we want to divide by a smaller number in order, well, I guess that would make T a little bit larger. Um, so we want, hmm, the time, well, yeah, because I guess, because if this, if, if, yeah, exactly, because we do, we do want the time, we want the time to be larger. So we want, we want to divide by a smaller number because that will keep the person becoming, you know, from becoming hypothermic too soon. So in other words, this is probably more realistically five hours or something because this, the surface, the skin temperature would gradually fall off, which would be good for the person because that would slow down the rate of the heat flow. All right. Okay. So there's our last example. Again, pretty simple examples, hopefully an interesting concept and the conclusion of chapter 11. Thank you so much for watching this lecture video. I hope it was interesting and informative.